Father God, you are the creator of heaven and earth, and your glory stems from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Again, Father, I pray the prayer of Samson. Let that anointing fall just one more time, and let it reach out and touch every person here by the power that you're placed in your word. We ask this not for anything that we have done, but we ask it in the name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach. For it's only through that name that we can stand before your holy throne of grace, praising you, lifting you up, and glorifying your holy name. Amen. Amen. This is an interesting subject. I am not kidding. When you talk about the Parsha Kiddoshim, I... I read this, and I, I know some of the problems that was going into this congregation, and it, and it hurts probably more than most people realize about what has been happening. But again, we're looking at the basis as far as holiness is concerned. We dealt with the holiness as it dealt with the reading of the Parshas up here and the Bred Hadashah and the Haftorah. We're dealing with the elements as far as the kids is concerned, and guess what? Now it's your turn. When we wind up looking at the element of the holiness code, we wind up taking a look, first of all, what the outline is. I always outline the, the Parsha so that I can stay within the context of what I'm looking at. But when you, before we even start to look at the holiness code, we have to look at a thought process that exists. You've got to consider between a Hebraic thought and a Western thought. Now, when you do that, remember something. Western thought is linear. I mean, you go from sequence to the basis as far as uh, of the chronological order that exists. And that's the way we see it in a straight line. That is not the way it's done in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it is in a circular line. It's dealing with the basis as far as having a point that spreads out all the way through in the process. And that point that normally hits is an action. Remember what was said at the time that uh, they were ready to get the Ten Commandments. The children of Israel said, I will do, we will do, and we will hear. It did not say we will hear and we will do. It dealt with the structure of an action. When you look at the element of the basis of Hebrew, you've got to remember something else. There's no adjectives in Hebrew. That is, that is uh, a Greek. If I was going to say I'm angry, angry is an adjective. When you, when it, and it's a static structure. But when you say it in Hebrew, is I'm flaring my nose. That's exactly what it means. So in that structure, it is an adverb. Hebrew operates through adverbs, which are actions that are designed to do. And it, it, it reaches out in all, gen, all parts of it. It's like, like a ripples of a water, and you take an element of a stone, and you drop it in. And that stone becomes the action, and it ripples out all the way out all over the place. It's the same as if you have a point of a compass and goes all the way around. When somebody asks me a question, do they get a straight yes or no answer? Anybody who knows me knows that is not true. I will come at you seven ways from Sunday. <laughs> because, because, again, I'm, I'm coming with different individual ideas as to what is in that ripple of the action of the question that you asked. That is a Hebraic thought pattern. And it's got to be, that, and it stands out because there are bookends in the beginning and at the end of this group. And this is this part of it. This is why this Torah essence, this action structure, is wrapped up into this particular Parsha of Kedoshim. When you wind up looking at it, it is called the Holiness Code. Now, I want you to understand, you saw your kids out here, and they're going to learn Kiddoshim. But if you were in a Hebrew school, this is what you will learn first in the process as far as the Bible is concerned. These two chapters is what you're going to learn. Why? Because they produce action. And it's taught that way to the kids. They will memorize these two chapters before they go to Genesis chapter 1. 
So it just gives you an idea to how strong this particular Porsche is as it relates to because they would deal it. Okay, because we're going to deal with this. Why? Because of the word holiness. You have the word holiness is mentioned 421 times in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's listed 77 times in Leviticus, and it's actually implied 150 times. And what it does, because people get so confused with this particular book because it's not chronological, it's bam, right there. And, and they get so confused with this book, and the reason for that is because it's unveiling the holiness of God. And it's like peeling back an onion. When you peel it back, you've got more there, and, and, and as you get closer, it gets stronger. When you, it, it becomes very, very strong. It's like the rolling of a basis of a uh, cloth. You start at the end, and you work to the middle, and as you get to the middle, it gets redder. If the cloth is red at the beginning, it will get redder as you get to the beginning. And that's the way it works. And in that process, it's, it's designed that particular way. Why? Because it deals between the element of becoming acceptable to God and through this process, which is holy. Now, as I said before, for most believers, holiness is a very puzzling term. We are willing to be holy, but we don't quite understand what holiness is. You know that God is holy, and you realize that you are to be holy as he is. However, how are you going to be like him? Now, when you take a look in Leviticus chapter 19 and 20, you're going to find it as a very strong impression of God's holy character. And if you want some kind of an insight, and to the nature of holiness, all you've got to do is to meditate on some of these verses. And I guarantee you, it's going to tell you a lot about God's holiness. I'll tell you what the call is not. The call is not always through some mystical experience. And it's also not a guarantee of success or failure. The, the, very, the more you depend on yourself, I guarantee you, you will fail. The more you depend upon God, the more you will succeed. It's as simple as that. And now there's, there's something that happens only to God. From those come directly to people. There are four calls, four calls that are given to you. There's a call to salvation. There's a call to holiness. There's a call to ministry. And there's a call to a very specific task. And when you receive any elements of these particular calls, you've got no choice but to follow it. How about holiness in the family? Okay. What happened? I know what happened. I turned the wrong page. <laughs> Leviticus. All right. Come on, be nice to me. All right. Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. It was read today. It's the very first verse of, of the Parsha itself. There is a book in at the end, but it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the entire congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, as God's priest, how would you follow a command like this? Now, think about it. what other command can match this one. You shall be holy. There's no other command like this. And it states that you've got to be like God. And the one thing inspires us to holiness, but to be commanded to be holy? How in the world are you going to do this? Okay? We're going to take some look at this. You know, we lack the qualities that the holiness of God has, actually in perfect balance. And if you do not look at the rest of this Porsche, it would be an absolute guarantee for a headache. I guarantee it. But, you, but it, gives you, it gives you commands that can help you. And it helps you in a lot of ways to be able to explain the command of being holy. And it gives you very critical understanding just exactly what it means. Now, I want you to consider something. Only five Porsches are smaller than Kedushim. 
only five. But no other Porsche has, in, as in Kiddushim, has more commandments than Kiddushim. No other Porsche. Kiddushim has 51 commandments that are, that are uh, uh, prohibit and 13 commandments that are, are 13 uh, positive and 38 prohibits. Now, when you look at that one, that's a total of 51 commandments wrapped up out of one portion of two chapters when it's a total of 613. So it gives you an idea. It's just about what portion is handling out of two chapters. Now, the nation is commanded to be holy. And we, all of these are taught, and you've got to realize something. That as God's priest, let's take a look at some of these, okay? First, there's idolatry. Then there's eating offerings after their time limit. Then there's theft, and then there's robbery. There's a denial of theft. There's false oaths. There's a retention of somebody's property. There's a delaying payment to an employee. There's a hating and cursing a fellow Jew, particularly if they're your parents. There's gossip, and there's placing physical and spiritual stumbling blocks. There's a perversion of justice. There's inaction when others are in danger. There's embarrassment to other people. There's a revenge. There's carrying a grudge. There's crossbreeding. There's the wearing of a garment and linen together. There's a harvesting of a tree during its first three years. There's gluttony. And then there's intoxication. There's witchcraft. And then there's a shaving of the beard and sideburns. And then there's tattooing. There's awe for the parents and respect for the elderly. These are positive. There's leaving part of the harvest to the poor. There's loving others, especially a convert. No convert is considered a second-class citizen. Then there's eating the fruit on the tree's fourth year in Jerusalem. There's the awe for the temple, and there's respect for the teachers and the rabbis, and then for the blind, and then for the deaf. That is what's in two chapters. That is what some of the things your kids are going to learn today. It gives you an idea of what you're looking at. The family's life must be holy. And we are warned against not to imitate any kind of Gentile or pagan behavior or what. You're going to lose the land of Israel. Remember, we are a connection of bringing in the nations to recognize Israel. And by recognizing Israel, we are part of that covenant that exists between God and Israel. That's the only way you can be in the covenant. It's connected to Israel. Now, you, we also observe biblical kashrut and maintain our very unique and separate status. Now, I'm going to ask a question. How many people have you heard say, well, that's the Old Testament, but it's not mentioned in the New Testament? And I'm going to ask the question. Does that mean that because it's not mentioned in the New Testament, that is not okay now? I want you to very sick, think about that. Because if your answer is yes, I got to tell you something right now. You do not understand scripture. Let me give you just two commandments that I give you an understanding of what I'm talking about. Did you know that as sick and as perverted as bestiality is, that it's, not, that it's forbidden, it's only forbidden in the Old Testament to our law? You're not going to find it in the New? Now I'm going to ask you a question. Does that make it okay? Well, how about Leviticus 19, verses 29? This is part of the Parsha today. It is written, Do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute. That commandment is found here. You're not going to find it in the Old Test in the New Testament. Does that make it okay? Now, I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of other laws. I just picked on two. But there are a lot of other laws that can be found and forbidden in the Old Testament, but not recognized in the New Testament. 
Now, if you take a look in what is known as Matthew Henry's commentary at the beginning of Leviticus chapter 19, what it explains is that Leviticus 19's commandments do not apply only to Israel, but it also applies to the New Testament believer today. So you cannot isolate it and say that these two chapters only relate to the Jews, because that's not the way it was designed in the New Testament. Now, God does not tell his redeemed not to do things if they're too hard to be, and it's impossible. I didn't say that. He did. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11 to 14, it reads, For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who shall go up to heaven to, be taped, to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us and get it for us to make us hear it, that we may observe it. The word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Now, in that scripture, what commandment is mentioned? To a Jewish understanding, it is the entire book of Deuteronomy. It is not in a single structured commandment. That's the structure. Remember the dot as it goes out. That's the thinking of it. And it's, it's the entire book of Deuteronomy. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How many times have you heard about the curse of the law? Okay. You know, when God leads you into the process of becoming Torah observant, you know what's going to happen to you. And you're going to get by your friends. You're going to get lamb blasted. And here's what's going to come at you. Watch out. If you obey the law, then you're going to fall from grace. And then you're under the curse of the law. I know. I have heard it more times than you can count. It will come at you. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Remember, we're talking about the curse of the law. When we look at the curse of the law in total, when you're looking at the element of a Jewish person when he sees the Torah, its curse is total. And to them, you will be saying that if you remove the curse, you must, if you say this, watch out, if you obey the Torah, you're going to fall from grace and be under the curse of the law. You're going to wind up telling them that they must disobey the Torah so that they don't fall. That means that they must steal, murder, lie, and cheat in order for God to bless them. Is that true? No. And that's the way they would see it. And yet, because of Deuteronomy 18, a Jewish person is going to reject it immediately. So when you put this in front of a Jewish person, you have already shut the door on him. It's as simple as that. But now, we got another problem. How about the curse in part? Okay. This is where we walk into that Greek mindset again. Remember, Hebrew, Greek. Here's where we walk into that Greek mindset. And we try to separate the Torah into four separate sections without understanding, with no precedent, and the divisions are given in Scripture to make a decision of which sections we are going to obey or disobey. They are the purity laws, the ceremonial laws, the civil and the wartime laws, and the temple and the sacrifices. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If that is true, what parts of the law brings the curse? Makes sense. Answer the question. If you were talking about the purity laws, that's the most likely candidate you're going to find up here, but I'm going to tell you. Were not the Pharisees and the others continually condemned for their emphasis on these laws? If you read the Bible, you know that's true. Does not the rejection of these laws give you the freedom from the curse of the law? If you study the purity laws, you're going to realize that many of them simply involve basic sanitation, health, and hygiene. And to remove this curse of the law, you're going to be blessed when they require you to become unsanitary, unhealthy, and unhydrotic. Un now think about that. How does that make sense? It doesn't. Well, let's look at the ceremonial laws. Come on, work with me, baby. There it is. <laughs> 
If you do not like to be unsanitary, unhealthy, or unhygienic, then could it be the ceremonial laws that's going to give you the curse? You know, the ceremonial laws were designed to bring God's miracles and abiding presence to the forefront and to remembrance. And I'll tell you right now, it happens every time we do the biblical feast. Every time you do the biblical feast, you are bringing God forward and for the understanding. And as you're going to find out as you grow, you're, what you learned for the first time walking in here, it's like overload. Bam, what is overload, man? But then the second time around, you get a little bit of a habit because you know what, what to expect. So now you're really starting to learn just exactly what you did the first time. Why? Because you did the action the first time. Now you're doing the action the second time. Now you're learning more. The third time around, guess what? You're doing the action again. Guess what? You're going to learn more. You do the action again. You're going to learn more. And it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And that, that is the process of what happens when you deal with the ceremonial laws. Now, it is written in the basis of Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How about this question? If the biblical feasts are God's appointed feasts and not the Jewish feasts, are you under a curse if you obey them or if you not obey them? Now think about that. What does that mean? Every, as I said before, every holiday gives the observers that God has an active interest in the human process of affairs. When you go through those feasts, you've got that process of knowing God has an active interest in you. And you, it, it will draw you closer to God. Anyone who's ever did those feasts, you will understand what I'm saying. Now, we had to add one. How about the civil and the wartime laws? You know, these laws instruct people on how to be good, lawful citizens. They focus on just and fair retribution for crimes, reporting crimes to civil authorities, preventing biases and favoritism in laws and judgment, and ensuring that the welfare of non-citizens. Is this the curse you're trying to avoid? I want you to think about it. Other than lawyers, judges, and government officials, most of them have never been faced with these choices. This would be an easy one to call the curse of the law. But does that mean that by settling illegal activities on your goal, are you going to be removed from the curse of the law? Again, think about it, because that's what you're saying. Okay, well, let's try the element as far as the temple sacrifices are concerned. The temple sacrifices are in hold. It will, it will start up again based on Ezekiel chapter 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48. It will, be, it will come back again when the temple is rebuilt. So don't wind up saying we no longer have to celebrate the sacrifices. You're going to find the sacrifices a little bit different, a, lot, a little bit different. You're going to find them a lot different in those sacrifices in those chapters, but I guarantee you the sacrifices will still be there. But when you deal with that, without the temple, as I said, they, they do not exist. But uh, why did they exist? They existed so that you could sin and go to the temple and symbolically transfer the identity out to the animal sacrifice. And today, that sacrifice of Yeshua is given to you. When you deal with the basis as far as the sacrifices are concerned, you have to realize something. When God you gave the element as far as the blood was concerned of Yeshua. That blood covered you for good. But you've got to stay under the blood. See, see, remember what I said? You got to stay under the blood. Not the blood go with you. You have to go with the blood. And there's a great deal of difference in what I just said. Does the rejection of the sacrifices that God gave to develop the fellowship with him, can that be called a curse of the law? Well, 
had just tore up the purity laws, the ceremonial laws, the civil and the wartime laws, and the temple and the sacrifices. Well, why don't we find out just exactly what the curse of the law is? Death is the curse for all of those animals that were being sacrificed on behalf of their owners. And death was also the curse placed on Yeshua on behalf of Israel. And we, by attaching ourselves to Israel, are covered under that basis of that same sacrifice. You know, a lot of animals were dying to symbolize dedication, commitment, sin, guilt, and fellowship. Could death actually be the curse of the law? Is it possible that the curse has nothing to do with obeying the Torah, but the curse has, has everything to do with the violation of the Torah? Think about that. The curse of a law does not apply to those who obey it, but it applies to those who violate it. Since most people violate it at some point or the other, the curse of the law falls on everybody. And that's not fun. Now, if the curse of death falls on everyone who violates the Torah, and yet people keep telling the Torah keepers that the curse of those who obey it, then, then who should fear the law's curse? In many cases, people claim to know Yeshua, but they do not. They even have outward spiritual signs of the Ruach HaKodesh. I didn't say that. Yeshua did. You're going to find that in Matthew chapter 7, 19 to 23. It's at the very end on the Sermon on the Mount. And you're, what it says, it says, Every tree that brings forth, that does not bring forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Everybody's a fruit inspector. And don't think when you change and you wind up becoming a Torah observant believer, you don't have a lot of fruit inspectors watching you. Don't you even think that for a moment. You do. You have fruit inspectors watching you as you walk, okay? Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils? And in your name done many wonderful works. And then what's he going to say? Then I'm going to tell him, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work lawlessness. How is that working lawlessness? Well, why don't we find out? The last words in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, serves as a warning. I never knew you. Depart from me, all you who work lawlessness. The Greek word, emona, used for lawlessness, means absence of the law or the absence of Torah. The words, you that work lawlessness, literally means you who act as if there was no Torah. That's exactly what it means. And what it does, it confirms Yeshua's statement in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. Now, how do you handle this? Let me show you something. You know, these people in the verses, Matthew chapter 7, have two primary characteristics. When you read it, they got two primary characteristics. These are people who are very heavy in spiritual gifts. They're in spiritual gifts. They're prophets. They speak. They believe that you're speaking for God to men. They are exorcists. They are casting out evil spirits. They are miracle workers. I came out of Benny Hinn. They are miracle workers. Tongues, healing, slain in the spirit. I got it all. Today we call them charismatics. I'm not kidding. Because when you lock it into this structure, you've got to be careful what you're talking about. All right? Now, how in the world do you handle this? Peter, 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16 says this. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully in the grace that you will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. 
as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you holy is holy, you shall be holy in all your conduct. That's as is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. In your conduct, the action point that produces the ripples in, in everything you do. You know, again, I'm going to repeat the very first verse of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. It says, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is the commandment to you if you are God's priest. You know, a holy person is separated and dedicated to God. That's, that is the number one process. And when you look at it, you've got to realize Leviticus does not allow us to put our lives into compartment areas where we've got one part holy and another part maybe a little bit holy, and here we're going to do something else that ain't goodly. They don't allow those compartments to work. It just doesn't work. It affects your business, your relationship, and social justice. A holy person dedicates every part of their life to God. So i got to ask you a final question. Are you holy? Shabbat shalom.